is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to one of our Wednesday Yachting Luncheons. Fun to have everybody here. So uh, next week, you want to come by on the 28th of February, because we will have as our Wednesday Yachting Luncheon speaker, Daniela Morose. And if that name rings a bell, it's because you've been paying attention to the news. Daniela, by age 22, she just recently turned 23, but the credentials I'm about to recite all were hers by age 22. By age 22, she was a six-time world champion, a four-time Rolex Yachts Woman of the Year, a four-time uh, European champion, and a two-time U.S. Sailing Sailor of the Year by age 22. She then became, uh, about a month or so ago, the very first member named to the United States sailing team, male or female. And she is, without question, the most credentialed sailor that the Bay Area has ever sent to the Olympics. We thought, because of all that, it would be completely appropriate that we throw a bon voyage party for her. So come by, bring your friends, because we've never sent off such a credentialed person in the sport within which she will compete at the Olympics. So it would be one thing to win a couple soling world championships and star world championships and then go off and race in the fin or something, but she won all of these things in the very class that is now an Olympic sport. And you may say, well, what is this kite boarding that she does? Kite foiling is what it really is. Uh, the formula kite is a foiling board. She's about three feet above the water. They go about 20 knots up the breeze and about 30 knots off the breeze, but they can achieve in wind speeds up to 50 miles an hour. Think about flying along the water three feet, three feet above it at 50 miles an hour. That's twice as fast as you go at fast speeds on a water ski. And um, the blade on the foils is literally razor sharp. The trailing edge is razor sharp. And all that technology is part of the game. So the competitors are not just great sailors and understand what's going on with wind shifts and the tactical side of sailing, but also they have to pay attention to the fact that they've got this super technology underneath them, the latest technology underneath them. And it's sharp. It's razor sharp. And uh, they're going 50 miles an hour at the fastest. And so um, this competitive kite foiling will now uh, come to the Olympics for the first time. It'll be raced in um, Marseille. And so I, for one, am gonna go to Marseille and uh, cheer her on, but you all get a chance to be with her uh, next Wednesday right here on the 28th. So that's a kind of a fun, special WIL. Pass the word to your friends. We wanna give her a really great bon voyage. Now a little bit about today's speaker. So when you hear the name Spreck, you might think to yourself, wait a second, is that related to Spreckle Sugar? Because all of us, and I was born in the Bay Area, all of us who come from San Francisco, and I was born in the St. Francis Hospital here in San Francisco, I heard the name Spreckle Sugar for years and years and years. And in fact, our speaker day is in fact a direct line descendant of the founder of Spreckle Sugar Company in the 1870s. His forefathers came here to San Francisco and uh, Klaus and later his sons uh, started this sugar company and had beet um, uh, harvesting in Hawaii that was all part of the sugar company. And they basically um, became very big benefactors to the uh, city. In fact, the Palace of the Legion of Honor, if you've been there, is a beautiful place. And that was basically built by uh, Spreckles for San Francisco. Anyway, our speaker today um, was born in Oakland, born in Berkeley. And uh, if he developed a renegade streak early, it wouldn't be a surprise being born in Berkeley. He went to college prep, a nice high school over there in Oakland, then went off to UC San Diego with a math degree and showed real early his propensity for numbers and sophisticated math. I uh, went to work for the Environmental Defense Fund and those of us who remember Fortran, remember Fortran? It was his early uh, language 
uh, Michael Holen raised his hand, early uh, computer language uh, on mainframes. Um, anyway, he became a Fortran programmer. And so um, in uh, 1999, David Brower, then executive director of the Sierra Club. Now, you'll recall the Sierra Club was founded by John Muir to preserve beautiful parts of nature all around you know, the world, but especially in California. Well, David Brower saw and met and spent time with our speaker today and, and recruited him to be part of what would be Restore Hetch Hetchy. Now, on the subject of Restore Hetch Hetchy or replacing the water we get from Hetch Hetchy with other newer technologies, one right away has to question, holy cow. I mean, I said to myself, why would San Francisco want to replace this amazing water supply we've had for, you know, almost a little over a century? And the answer is part of what he's going to talk about. I started a company uh, in 99. Called, in, called uh, Yipes in Metro Ethernet. And at first everybody said, why would you put Ethernet over fiber? And we pointed out where it would only cost 1% of what the telephony bandwidth costs. And that company is now part of a $50 billion industry. So great ideas often start out really crazy. And if anybody would have told us a long time ago that this would not just be a phone, but a calendar and a, a photo album and a television screen and a recorder, you'd say, that's a crazy idea. So I have learned a long time ago to listen to what seemed like seemingly goofy ideas and listen carefully to the kernels of them because therein may lie some great innovation. And so with that, I want to welcome our speaker today. Um, uh, come on up, Spreck, and tell us all about um, your vision to uh, restore the Hetch Hetchy Valley, once a part of Yosemite, and now a big giant reservoir in Yosemite. Thank you, Spreck. Thanks, buddy. Ron, thanks very much it's, uh, for the wonderful introduction, and it's an uh, honor to speak here today at the St. Francis Yacht Club. Uh, I want to talk about Hetch Hetchy, and it's always a, a, a provocative subject, especially in San Francisco. If you go somewhere else, it may be a little less so, uh, but Yosemite is such a, a beautiful place. We want to make the most of it, and water is, of course, essential. And we have to make sure we're not going to restore Hetch Hetchy unless every drop of water is replaced. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, first, uh, so today I'm going to first talk a little bit about the history of Hetch Hetchy and its damming. You probably know the basics. I won't get too far into it, but I'll, I'll say a few things. Uh, then I'm going to talk about water and a little bit less about power. Power is important, but it's, there are more options. Um, then I'm going to talk about the... Uh, next steps that we as an organization are taking. Uh, I hope you'll become interested in us, and then we'll do some Q&A. Uh, so first, I'm going to start with a, a, a couple of videos. Um, this was done. Yeah, so I believe that's our objective right here. We, yeah, that's Hetch Hetch. Excuse me. Uh, we did this video a few years ago. Uh, this is just a one-minute clip of it with some Climbers, Yosemite Valley is the most famous place in the world to climb, and there are similar climbing uh, uh, rocks at Hetch Hetchy, but it's just harder to get to. So uh, this is a, a world-famous climber, Timmy O'Neill, talking about his trip here. You know, it's so reminiscent of Yosemite Valley. It's a doppelganger. Very few people get back there, and even fewer get up on the walls. A big difference between Hetch Hetchy and Yosemite Valley is the conflict. Hetch Hetchy was drowned, was lost. Hetch Hetchy needs advocates, as Yosemite does, to try and undo the damage done. Their mission is to restore this place to its original state without the dam. Our vision for Hetch Hetchy is to relocate the reservoir and return the valley to park visitors. It's that simple, but uh, obviously complicated. One more short clip from uh, Doug McConnell, uh, used to do bang, back rows, now called open rows. Well, the notion of restoring California's many mountain meadows is a big, audacious idea that's making significant progress, which makes me wonder, what if, just what if, we could possibly restore Yosemite Valley's Twin Valley? 
Her çerçek. When we're talking about montane meadows across the Sierra Nevada, there is that flooded valley is the jewel of them all. Obi Kaufman painter, poet, and author of highly regarded books on California's natural history, has imagined strolling beside the Tuolumne River in the meadows of glacier-carved Hetch Hetchy Valley, considered the equal of nearby Yosemite Valley. When Yosemite National Park was established in 1890, the Twin Valleys were protected. But despite vigorous opposition led by John Muir, President Woodrow Wilson signed the Raker Act in Sorry. Uh, uh oh, now I'm. Okay, I'm. Excuse me, I'm. I don't know how to go backwards here. Okay, here, here we go. Sorry. Of the notion of restoring California's men poet and author of highly regarded books on California's natural history has imagined strolling beside the Tuolumne River in the meadows of glacier-carved Hetch Hetchy Valley, considered the equal of nearby Yosemite Valley. When Yosemite National Park was established in 1890, the Twin Valleys were protected. But despite vigorous opposition led by John Muir, President Woodrow Wilson signed the Raker Act in 1913, authorizing the city of San Francisco to dam the Tuolumne and flood Hetch Hetchy to provide water for the Bay Area, the only time an outside institution has been allowed to appropriate national park property for its own use. Ever since, calls to remove the dam and restore Hetch Hetchy Valley have been successfully rebuffed by the city. Um, so, where did all this start? It started with Abraham Lincoln back in 1864 with Confederate troops literally marching on Washington. He signed a bill to protect uh, not Hetch Hetchy, but Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Grove. It was really the first time in human history when people said, wait a minute, we have some spectacular landscapes we need to preserve. And that all started in Yosemite. This is before Yellowstone and before anything else really around the world. Um, uh, it, one interesting early visitor to Yosemite was James Garfield. Before he was president, took a trip out to Hetch Hetchy. He had been a congressman, he was chairman of the Appropriations Committee, and then Congress flipped, and he lost power, and next thing he did is he got on the Transcontinental Railroad, took it to Sacramento, took another train to Sacramento, took a stagecoach to uh, Mariposa, and then rode horseback to the Mariposa Grove, and then to Yosemite Valley, uh, all while suffering from his hemorrhoids. Um, uh, but he was, uh, he just thought it was the most fantastic thing and he wrote these words here about the, about the 3,000 year old trees in the Mariposa Grove and then brought that back to, that, that the stories back to Washington. I am, um, okay, I'm, I, I, I missed a slide there, I'm going on. Uh, in 1906, uh, well, San Francisco first asked to build a dam there in Hetch Hetchy in 1890. San Francisco was beholden to this private uh, Spring Valley Water Company. Uh, they, wanted, they first went in 1890 to Hetch Hetchy. They said they wanted to build a dam. There was a national park. They were told twice by the federal government, no, you can't build a dam in a national park. Don't you get it? The Board of Supervisors passed a resolution to quit talking about Hetch Hetchy. Um, and then in 1906, there was the earthquake and maybe more importantly, a fire that destroyed much of the fire of the city. There was water in nearby reservoirs, but the, all the pipelines within the city broke and they couldn't fight them. Uh, so San Francisco doubled down. They just, there were other alternatives available. I won't get into those right now, uh, but uh, former Mayor Phelan came back and pushed an effort to, to go forward with building a dam in Hetch Hetchy. They supported uh, Woodrow Wilson for president, 
and convince Wilson to appoint San Francisco's city attorney as Secretary of the Interior to try and help push legislation through Congress. Uh, legislation was introduced by Congressman Raker of Manteca, it became the Raker Act, and it was passed. And uh, it became the first big environmental battle. The New York Times editorialized against it four times in 1913, more than 200 newspapers around the country opposed it. What do you mean? This isn't what we're supposed to do with national parks. We're supposed to leave them the way they are for people to explore. Uh, but the, the Ray Crack did pass, and Hetch Hetchy Reservoir was built. It's been a, a serviceable reservoir as part of San Francisco system, and it remains to this day the only reservoir ever built in an existing national park. And I'll just say right now, one of the reasons why many of us are inspired to restore it is because when people start to care about the natural world or people learn about the natural world and how it's protected, so many people first learn about it in terms of Yosemite. They go to Yosemite, they love Yosemite, uh, then they learn about air pollution and the ocean pollution and other issues and so forth, but it's sort of the, 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 the uh, spawning ground for m many people to care about the natural world. Um, but if anything, while Yosemite is beautiful and awesome, um, um, you know, what about the water? You know, you need, we need water. We can't just throw away uh, reservoirs. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, we have been, in recent years, removing dams. Uh, there's been a, probably more than a thousand removed across the country. Most of them are small. One of the uh, important ones on Clear Creek up north, and one of the lesser known ones was McCormick Seltzer was removed 25 years ago uh, to bring endangered spring run salmon back into the, into the watershed. And I assume most people have read about the dam removal on the Klamath that just happened uh, after many years. Um, and I'll note that the Klamath uh, does have real impacts, not, not for water supply, because those dams were not used to provide water to people, but for hydropower, about uh, 690 uh, gigawatt hours per year. And I think I, oh, I had the math for this yesterday, but I was thinking about, you know, this was like two million people running a toaster oven for an hour uh, every day for a year. It's, just to sort of put that in context, if you don't usually work in gigawatt hours. Um, some other dams that are, that are probably going to be removed soon are Scott and Cape Horn dams on the Eel River, and you may be aware that water from the Eel River is taken through a tunnel into the Russian River to help farmers there and also to provide flows in the Russian River, and that's sort of an ongoing thing right now that deals mostly, mostly in place. Um, but what about the water? Uh, most of you, I assume, either live in San Francisco or maybe on the peninsula, uh, and you're part of the Hetch Hetchy system. And uh, so I want to first of all say, excuse me, I want to first of all say that this is a place to store water. It's not a source. It's sometimes confused as a source. It's an important uh, storage tank. It's one of uh, nine in San Francisco system. Let's take a look briefly at San Francisco system. There's four reservoirs in the Tuolumne watershed where 85% of the water comes from. The largest is downstream is Don Pedro. It holds six times as much water as Hetch Hetchy does. Uh, it is owned and operated by the Turlock and Modesto irrigation districts. And basically about a third of it is dedicated to storage for San Francisco and its regional water system. So it's about twice, that's about twice the size of Hetch Hetchy. Also in the watershed are uh, Cherry and Eleanor Reservoirs, which together are about the size of Hetch Hetchy. So Hetch Hetchy is certainly important and it's the best known, but it's not the only storage. And then there are five smaller reservoirs in the Bay Area. And the one you see uh, in Alameda County, Calaveras Reservoir is, uh, is, is possible to expand. That's a, one of the options that we've been, we've been promoting. Um, so 
first of all, it's not just Restore Chechi that said that uh, you can restore the valley and replace all the water. Uh, it's been, there have been many, many reports. Uh, the first one was done by the Bureau of Reclamation back in 1987 when Secretary Hodel under President Reagan proposed restoration. Okay, um, thank you. Um, the, uh, the second one, Paradise Regained, uh, I was the principal author of it, the Environmental Defense Fund, along with many other staff members. But what I want to tell you about that report is the appendices were written by mainstream engineering firms, uh, Schlumberger and uh, EWA Water, may, maybe not household names, but not tree huggers. The basic guts of that report was done by mainstream people who usually get their income from doing planning for, for water agencies. Uh, two professors from UC Davis, uh, Jay Lund and Sarah Knoll, uh, did a report, uh, Restore Achechi. Uh This was before I was uh, executive director of Restore Achechi. And then finally, uh, Yosemite's Opportunity, uh, we, we produced a year ago, and that's uh, on your table, it's on our website, and it's it's really just a shortened version of showing what options are available uh, today. And we've been promoting uh, something called groundwater banking, uh, which is, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. So Hetch Hetchy Reservoir here is 360,000 acre feet. And we measure water in acre feet. It's an acre one foot deep. Uh, and other uh, recently built dams in California, in Southern California, uh, San Diego and Contra Costa have uh, topped about over a million acre feet. So there are other surface storage options. San Francisco's option is to increase the size of Calaveras Reservoir, and that could be done to replace the storage that's at Hetch Hetchy. Uh, secondly, uh, what urban agencies in California have done in the last 30 years is essentially paid farmers to recharge groundwater in wet years, take it out in dry years, and make more surface water available to, um, to urban agencies. And it's uh, been done in Southern California, it's been done in Northern California. Uh, certainly the San Jose area, the Santa Clara Valley Water District has done that. The Pleasanton and, and Fremont areas have done that. San Francisco has a good groundwater banking program of its own, it's smaller, that banking is actually down in Colma, down where all the cemeteries are. San Francisco has paid those folks to, to let that aquifer recharge and then to use that water when it comes back out during, uh, during dry years. And then finally, cities all over California, especially in the Southland, are recycling water. And that would, a recycling program up here would be much more expensive than a groundwater program it would have the benefit, however, of cleaning up the bay. And you may recall uh, a year and a half ago, we had a big fish kill in the bay and toxic algae bloom and whatever. And what San Diego did was they had to clean up their sewage treatment plant. And they said, well, we could pay a little bit more or maybe a lot more and use it to increase water supply. And so they're both cleaning up the beaches in San Diego and improving water supply. But together, uh, these programs have been put in place. This is over the last 30 years or so. They could replace water, the water storage now in Hetch Hetchy Reservoir 15 times over. All these options are available in San Francisco, so it definitely can be done. Um, one other person who was, um, I, I could have put several people on this slide, but I chose Carl Baronke. He was the general manager of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, an agency that serves uh, eight or so times the number of people that San Francisco's regional system serves. And he was always in favor of restoration. He sadly passed away a few years ago, but he believed that water systems should be more environmentally friendly and we shouldn't have to have a dam in a, in a national park. Um, so we are today advocating water solutions. And I would say I've successfully, we have convinced uh, the new general manager of 
San Francisco, Dennis Herrera, to pursue groundwater banking and with Turlock Irrigation District and other irrigation districts. Um, he doesn't want to restore the valley. Let me get, make that clear. He wants more water. There are people who want more water for salmon, and they're also promoting groundwater banking. Uh, but this is an opportunity. Last year we saw tons and tons of water run down our rivers. Much of that could have been captured and put back in the ground. Didn't happen on the Tuolumne River where San Francisco gets its water. Other agencies have done a, done a better job. Uh, but whether you're in favor of restoring Hetch Hetchy or not, you ought to be in favor of groundwater recharge in the, uh, in the wet years. Um, we've been building political support uh, among community groups, and uh, uh, there are some people in Congress that are interested. Nobody is quite willing to step out in front and get excited about it yet, but uh, 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 we do think that will, will happen someday, and we want San Francisco to take it seriously. And then finally, we're trying to improve the visitor experience at Hetch Hetchy, even while the dam is in place. It's a almost forgotten corner of Yosemite National Park. It gets about 1% of visitors to the park. And the Park Service has, has been busy in Yosemite Valley. You've read about their crowds. And they've really neglected Hetch Hetchy. Uh, if you've been to Yosemite Valley, you've seen Yosemite Falls and Glacier Point and Half Dome and all these things. And there are also places. Uh, at Hetch Hetchy, Hetch Hetchy Dome, Wapama Falls, Rancheria Falls, Kalana Rock, uh, that you'll see if, if you go to Hetch Hetchy. And when San Francisco passed, or when Congress passed the Raker Act, San Francisco promised that it, the area would be improved for recreation, and many of those promises really haven't been kept. We wrote about that a couple years ago in this report that you've seen around the room called keeping promises, and we're working today with the Park Service and others to try and improve access and recreation at Chechi, even, even while the dam is in place. Um, but today, there are a few trails. One common trail is along the north side of the reservoir to Wapama Falls, but when Wapama Falls is really flowing, you can't actually get to it because the, the bridge doesn't go over the creek and people have been actually washed over it to their, to their deaths. Um, you're not allowed to camp there unless you're leaving for or returning from a backpacking trip, unlike the rest of Yosemite. Uh, you're not allowed to boat on the reservoir. This is something San Francisco highlighted when they were uh, asking to build the reservoir, and Congress fully expected. Um, there's no public transportation. There's five entrances to Yosemite. Uh, buses go in the other four entrances, not in the Hetch Hetchy entrance. And the gate closes daily. You can't go there at night. It's very difficult to see the sunset or a, or a sunrise at Hetch Hetchy. Um, so again, we're working with the Park Service. Uh, we've got some people in Congress that are interested in improving recreation, again, even with the dam in place. Uh, Congressman McClintock is, is one such person. He introduced legislation a year ago, uh, and it's, it's in his district. Um, and we're undertaking research uh, this year with a, a graduate program at the University of Colorado to look into uh, um, to look into recreation at, at water supply reservoirs and what other national parks are doing and they're going to do a double blind taste test and we'll see if uh, people can tell the difference between water from they serve in Oakland or Berkeley and water in San Francisco um, and for those of you who say, hey, San Francisco is the best water, it's the best water in the world, it's the highest quality and whatever, who noticed last year, about eight or ten months ago, when the water from Hetch Hetchy was offline for two months? And you were drinking out of these other reservoirs down here. Which two months? Uh, I, I, I'm going to say mid-February to mid-April. Uh, anyhow, so here, um, one more video here. Well, it's all still there, isn't it? It's just drowned. It's just sunk. 
it's all still there underneath all of that water, that beautiful meandering meadow that is the uh, near the Tuolumne headwaters. There's very little in the way of soil in these glacial valleys. There's very little in the way of sediment. So remediation, cleaning up the place, might be a much easier process than we thought. She is a singular case. I mean, we're talking about a meandering water course within a shed that supports all nature of berries and Sierra orchids underneath a towering ponderosa fir mixed Sierra conifer trees that have known that place for centuries. We come up finally to uh, across a Yosemite that is that has rebuilt its resilient nature to defy the forces of of mortality that have plagued so much of the of the southern Sierra. With that, in conjunction with a number of other restorative efforts and projects across the many, many Sierra watersheds, that we're seeing this connected, rebuilt, restored, stronger than ever Sierra Nevada biome. It's possible, and it's ours for the taking. We believe in the beauty and the power and the dynamic nature of this place to heal itself, might we then find ourselves be healed too. Where we are redefining who we are as Californians in relation to this place, as we owe it to our grandchildren's grandchildren. Well, so thank you. So uh, I just ask people to uh, learn more if you're interested, to support us, to tell your friends, uh, even if you're skeptical. And uh, you can join our mailing list at Restore Achechi, and, and it's, it's free. And uh, this is a visionary uh, project for the future to keep water flowing to San Francisco and create the best most important restoration of a uh, national park that we've ever seen. So thank you very much. Thank you, you Spreck. So let's see, a couple questions. Um, right off the bat, got to know, um, what is the on, what are the ongoing costs of the current Hetch Hetchy Dam? What's it cost us? Well, the, the I'm not sure what you mean by the cost. We, we have estimated the. He'll check. Not happening. Um, we've estimated the cost of the life cycle cost of restoration of replacing the water, replacing the power, rerouting the water. Um, and the cost uh, we found over 50 years would be about $2 billion. So if over 50 years. So how staged is that $2 billion spend? How much of it in the front end? How much of it 50 years out? 50 years. That's a small number over 50 years. It, it's mostly uh, over time. Uh, it, it depends a little bit, mostly what's done on the power side. If, if you, if you uh, purchase power, it's done over time. If you install a lot of other uh, power plant or solar panels or something like that initially, then there's a higher upfront cost. So in short summary, how and where would we get water if we turned off the reservoir at Hetch Hetchy? Where would San Francisco get water? Well, there'd be a, a little bit of uh, piping needed initially. Uh, an inner tie to Hetch Hetchy. We've proposed two inner ties in the Tuolumne. Uh, they're in the Paradise Regained Report and other reports. Uh, one is at, actually at Don Pedro. The Hetch Hetchy pipeline actually goes literally under the reservoir, but mm -hmm. 
but there's no interconnection right now. The second one would be at Cherry Lake. Uh, the water from Cherry Lake comes through the something called the uh, home powerhouse. That water would be need to be piped about a mile to where the existing pipeline is. So those two things would would allow all the Tuolumne water that we have now to be to come to San Francisco. So if there was a mandate tomorrow to do this, how long would it take with your current plans to switch over from uh, the water that we get in Hetch Hetchy and to these alternate sources? Uh, it, it could certainly be done in, in under five years. Uh, the uh, utilities would want far longer, of course, mm -hmm. um, but it could be done in under five years. Those two pipeline switches would get most of the water uh, 95 would deliver 95 percent of the water and then to actually uh, if, if you're going to enlarge Calaveras Reservoir that would take longer or install a recycling plant that would take longer a groundwater program could be done much more quickly so as I understand what you said it isn't that we wouldn't have dams it's just that this particular dam we wouldn't use we use downstream and other dams to create what is effectively the reservoir water for San Francisco if, correct that misperception if that's wrong or if that, that, that that's exactly right and uh, restore Chechi is not against dams uh, dams are essential for water supply for hydropower for flood control for recreation but it's a question of which dam and in, in what place and Hetchetchi uh, the O'Shaughnessy Dam in Yosemite National Park is a place where we believe the, to recreate another Yosemite Valley is worth relocating that dam. So how deep is the current reservoir, let's say at, at, uh, at a high level, how deep is the water there? It's about 300 feet deep. Okay. What was it about the Hetch Hetchy Valley that made it suitable for, or in the case of the engineers who did it, ideal for creating a big reservoir? Um, it was an ideal place to build a dam because it's got a narrow outlet uh, at the west end of the valley. The dam is a fairly small dam. It's if, the, if it's 300 feet deep, the dam is 350 or 400 feet tall, um, but didn't take a lot of concrete. It's a nice place to build the dam. It was, however, a challenging place to build a pipeline coming all the way to San Francisco. Uh, many people died during an explosion in the what's called the Coast Range Tunnel, uh, when the water was being when that tunnel was being created to San, uh, to San Francisco, the dam was finished in '23. Water didn't get to San Francisco till 1934. And as an aside, uh, San Francisco asked Oakland if they wanted to be part of this project. Oakland said, "No, we think we'll do our own project." Oakland started first, uh, dammed the McCulmy River. And instead of going through the coast range, build a pipeline around Mount Diablo and, and finish first. And in the early 30s, uh, when there was a drought, they put an emergency pipeline across the bay to San Francisco to help out the city. So now, if you're a drop of water and you're going to come from Hetch Hetchy to get to um, our faucet in San Francisco, just give us briefly, what's the path that that water takes? How much of it's in pipes? How much of it's in, in any kind of open transport? Uh, none of it is an open transport. Uh, it, it, it goes through the, the canyon tunnel and generates power at something called the Kirkwood Power Plant. It does go briefly back into the river for a couple hundred yards and then is diverted. Which river? Uh, the Tuolumne River. Okay. Tuolumne River, uh, same as comes out of Tuolumne Meadows. Uh, and then it goes into something called the uh, Mountain Tunnel and generates power at Moccasin. And if you've driven to Yosemite, uh, across Don Pedro and through on 120, you've seen those big penstocks come down the, the mountain into Moccasin. Penstocks uh, are, what are those? Penstocks are, are reinforced pipelines to uh, provide pressurized water for hydropower generation. Um, and then from there, water goes underneath, uh, underneath Don Pedro Reservoir in another pipeline, um, and then uh, in, in, on the surface and what's called the San Joaquin pipelines across, across the valley and then in two more tunnels uh, coming through uh, the Bay Area going past uh, through Southern Alameda County. Um, a few years ago when San Francisco was worried about earthquakes, they especially wanted to 
rebuild a, a, a duplicative Irvington tunnel just east of Fremont because that's right where it crosses the Hayward Fault and they did successfully and, 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 and this was a good project, uh, put in a, a, a redundant Irvington tunnel so if there's an earthquake there's a much higher probability the water from the Tuolumne River will continue to flow and uh, we firmly supported that. So what would we do with that infrastructure if we stopped sending water from Hetch Hetchy to San Francisco? Well, all that, all that was still usable. Uh, even the Canyon Tunnel, we would create hydropower by allowing the flow of the river to go through that Canyon Tunnel. It's only O'Shaughnessy Dam itself, uh, which we either take down or some have proposed uh, just putting a hole in it and uh, putting an hotel on it. Um, so we're, 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 we're open-minded about that. Uh, if you're a mile up into the canyon, you're not going to be you're not going to be noticing there's a there's a 300 foot dam around the corner. Now I'm going to get to electricity in a minute, but just finishing up on the water side of things, if you lowered the water in the current reservoir 300 or so feet at its steepest point, and you uh, re-enabled the pastures that used to be there, at first it feels to me like it's going to look like desert. What's it going to look like at first, and how long is it going to take for flora, fauna, and trees and so on to start growing again? Yeah, the um, It's not full of silt. Like some, uh, some reservoirs have a lot of silt in it. This is high mountain, uh, high mountain granite watershed, and there's not much silt. The Park Service looked into this a few years ago, and they said that it would come back almost uh, within, within a couple of years, the river would go back to its natural course, uh, the animals would come back. Uh, where you, it would take, uh, since I'm an expert, I can tell you it takes uh, 100 years to grow a, a century old tree. Um, <laughs> and, That's an uh, estimate? Uh, that, yeah, rough, <laughs> give, or, give or take, give or take. And then, and then you have, a, then you have the, the, uh, the, the walls of the canyon where it take, take a few decades for lichen to grow back and you'd have this sort of bleached uh, granite on the sides of the walls and for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. What's the current number of tourists that visit Yosemite annually? It's about um, three and a half million go to Yosemite annually and about 40,000, so a little over 1% go to Hetch Hetchy. And what's the commercial value of that tourism in Yosemite? How much money, what's the economic impact of having Yosemite as a tourist environment? I, I don't have that number. I know we, we hired an economist to do that. I don't have those numbers handy, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's substantial. Uh, in the case of Hetch Hetchy, I don't think we're going to um, make it work on dollars and cents. I think it's gonna be <coughs> the human spirit and the human emotion, and do we really care about these natural landscapes? We're not gonna get the money back in, in park visitor fees or even lodging fees. Um, but it's something people care about. Uh, people care about the many parts of the natural world, and, and Yosemite is certainly one of them. So Greg Middleton, the first executive director of the president of the Presidio Trust and executive director of the Presidio, he pointed out to me um, when, in fact, I sponsored him to this club uh, 20 years ago, he said, you know, it's going to be the first national park that is self-sufficient, pays out of rental from commercial properties, Lucas and other commercial renters pay enough money so that we can have a public side and a private side, and this public-private partnership makes it self-sufficient. Yosemite has some commercial aspects to it. Is it economically self-sufficient? Uh, Yosemite is not economically self-sufficient. Uh, it does get a lot of private funding from the Yosemite Conservancy and they're a great organization and they've really fixed up many parts of the park, especially Yosemite Valley. Most recently they did a project at Bridalville Falls. If you've been to Yosemite Falls in the last 20 years, you've seen what they've done there and, and they would be uh, helpful at, uh, at Hetch Hetchy as well. But our national parks are, are, not, are not money makers with maybe a few exceptions. So how much does Yosemite cost us? If it's not self-supporting, what's it cost us? Uh, the Park Service budget is about $100 million a year. Okay. So if, Hetch, if Yosemite's not self-sufficient, what would your expectation be about the tourism power and earning potential of Hetch Hetchy Valley? 
Um, we're not going to... Um, the, the purpose of public land is is not to make money, and we're not going to make money at Hetch Hetchy. We would, we would make some, and, and there are things you can do, certainly, but the premise of our national parks is they're for everybody, and not just for people with money. If uh, People with money have houses at Tahoe. They have houses on the beach. They have their own. Uh, some people are members of the Bohemian Club. Uh, and some, pe some people have yachts. Uh, but uh, Some people. Everybody... Everybody has Yosemite, and Yosemite is for everybody. Could we get a microphone over to uh, this table, please, uh, Walter? Uh, it looks like my buddy Tommy Gilmore, longtime San Francisco family has owned, in fact. Your great-great-grandfather was mayor, I think, Tommy. So well, what's your question, buddy? Well, no, he was kind of, I'm probably a bad guy in this room because he was kind of behind building the dam. But my question <laughs> is, um, speaking of finances, does San Francisco and Hetch Hetchy pay Yosemite National Park a fee for having their facilities there? Um, San Francisco pays a rent of $30,000 a year. Um, however, they would be quick to say they also reimburse the park to the tune of about 7 or $8 million a year for watershed protection and for security, just like they pay for watershed protection and security um, for Crystal Springs and San Andreas Reservoirs on, on the peninsula. So is it, your, is it your model that we would replace Hetch Hetchy with other downstream or other dams and thus still get the water from Sierra to San Francisco? Or is it that a portion of it would come from those sources, the existing sources, but some additional new technologies would be deployed um, for the water coming to San Francisco for drinking water? Well, we outlined three uh, what we think are the most feasible alternatives. Uh, I talked about enlarging Calaveras Reservoir. If that were done, water from the Sierra, from the Tuolumne water now stored in Hetch Hetchy, would be stored in the Bay Area in Calaveras Reservoir. Where is that? Uh, it's in uh, eastern, southeast Alameda County, near Sonol. Okay. Um, and so that would be still 12 mirror water, no change in the use of 12 mirror water. So you're saying option A is that we'd use existing water, we wouldn't use new kind of res, uh, resurfaced or uh, regenerated water of any kind. Yes, and, and then an option B is to pay Turlock and Modesto to recharge groundwater and to use the existing surface reservoirs to supply more water to San Francisco. Now bear in mind that Turlock and Modesto used together four times as much 12 river water as, as the Bay Area. And For farm agriculture, you mean? Yes. Okay. And and so in that case, just as much 12 river water is gonna to come to San Francisco. So there's no change. Um, option C, which was recycling. Uh, and right now, so right now the, the breakdown is about 15% of the water served by San Francisco within the city and to customers outside the city comes from local sources and about 85% from the Tuolumne. So those two examples I just gave would still be 15%, 85%. If we didn't do either groundwater or Calaveras and said we recycled water, then you would find that up to 80% of the Tuolumne water or 80% of the water served would be still from uh, the Tuolumne River, 15% locally, and maybe 5% uh, from, from recycled water. So it's still almost all Tuolumne water under everything we've looked at. So it sounds like you're saying your ideal scenario would be to use a combination of water sources that wouldn't just be the water that would come down from the Sierra. Is that what you're saying? Right, but it's still primarily Tuolumne River water okay. from the Sierra. One last question before we go to some questions from the audience. Um, what do you mean when you say recharging water? Tell us what that means. So we all know that we've evacuated our groundwater basins. In some cases, the wa water table, the, the water, the land has actually sunk. In other cases, you can recharge those aquifers, and there's big business in California doing that. And there are engineers and engineering companies whose sole purpose is to figure out how to recharge groundwater. There are three basic ways to do it. 
One is to build a pond and have it seep back in. It helps to have the right geology. Another is to actually use pumps to inject the water back into the aquifer. And the third way is something called in lieu, which is to tell all the people pumping groundwater to stop pumping groundwater, give them surface water, let that water table come back on its own as it will. And that's what, what San Francisco has done down in Coleman and Daly City. That's an in lieu water recharge project. It's about 60,000 acre feet. It's about, so that's one side, one sixth the size of Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. Not enough certainly, but it's, it's a substantial project and a good project. Uh, staff Commodore Bruce Monroe has a question. Bruce. Yes, thanks, Ron. Um, I can remember many years ago when Dianne Feinstein was an influential member of the U.S. Senate. She came out strongly in favor of this project. But then it faded away and nothing ever came of it. My question is, if this is such a good idea and you're very persuasive in your story of why it is a good idea, why has it not happened? <laughs> why, why has it not happened? That's a good, I ask myself that every day. <laughs> um, so I think, I think Diane Feinstein was actually on the, the other side of this. Uh, she was very much opposed to it. Um, she was mayor when Don Hodel proposed restoration in the late 80s um, and sort of put the kibosh on it. I mean, no, nobody has taken out a, as important a dam, frankly. Um, when we first got the interest of Governor Schwarzenegger in the early 2000s, and he looked at it for a while, and then, as you may recall, he almost didn't get reelected, and he changed his whole outlook and, and sort of lost interest in it. Uh, we went on the ballot in San Francisco in 2012, got our butts kicked, and we went to court in um, 2015, 2016 in state court. I thought we had a good case, but... Uh, the judges tossed the case. Um, and right now, um, I can tell you there are people in Congress who are interested, but nobody wants to go out in front. It's more something that a, a Democrat would likely want to do. Um, but the biggest cheerleader, the Speaker of the House until recently, and the biggest fundraiser of the Democratic Party is, is Nancy Pelosi. And so nobody's really wanted to take her on. And, you know, we are a devoutly nonpartisan organization in a very curious political place because San Francisco is so progressive, so liberal in so many areas, yet it's the one city that has got a dam in a national park and, and Yosemite at that. So uh, we're trying to sort out the politics. We think we will eventually prevail. We're, we're a stubborn group. We've been around a while. Um, but, uh, you know, I ask myself that every day. Why hasn't it happened yet? Okay, so electricity, and uh, there's another question here. Electricity. So how much electricity do we get from the current uh, system at the dam, and how would we replace it? Um, so there's about 1,700 gigawatt hours. That's a million uh, kilowatt hours produced by three principal power plants. Um, one below Cherry Reservoir, one at Moccasin that you've seen, and one down in, another one in the Tuolumne Canyon at Kirkwood. So they're not right at the dam? No, it's... It's, it's spread it, out among it, three different facilities? Kirkwood is attached by the canyon tunnel to the dam. It's a few miles below, so you can get that, because hydropower is based on volume times, times height. And so you get the 300 feet of the dam plus another 700 feet of height in that Kirkwood, in that canyon tunnel and penstocks, you get more pressure. Uh, so of that 1,700, we estimate you'd lose about 350, um, that, and almost all at Kirkwood, because Kirkwood would only be generating power when the river is actually flowing. And so replacing that, uh, the simplest thing to do is, is probably solar power, but um, people have noted that you have to look at what power is available at night. And uh, the hydropower is, is not really dispatchable. Uh, other, some hydropower you can generate at night or whenever you need it. These days, 
power is worth almost nothing during the day because we have so much solar. So we have to probably rely on solar plus additional battery technology. And it's, it's just a tiny fraction of the solar and wind and geothermal that's gone in place in California in the last uh, couple of decades. We have uh, some numbers on that on our website. So the $2 billion cost over uh, multiple years, that includes building the solar um, regeneration uh, um, facilities? I think that's included in this estimate? Yeah, the two billion, about, about 700 million of the two billion is hydropower. It's for the electricity it's, it's replacement. For re it's for replacing the hydropower. Okay, uh, Billy has a question. Bill. Yeah, I had a question. It, 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 this is a good year for you to be here giving this presentation since we're in almost a record-setting rainfall year <laughs> and all the reservoirs are topped up. But I would think that the overall concern may be if, why would we eliminate a reservoir when every two or three years we have a drought or every five years and everybody's looking to find more capacity and expand the capacity? And so to, I understand you would, you're talking about how do we replace this, this particular reservoir, and maybe it's not that huge, but it seems to me more people are concerned about expanding capacity. And if you want to expand capacity at Calaveras Reservoir, the question is, why aren't they expanding capacity at Calaveras to protect during the drought years? And a lot of the climatologists are saying we're going to have more and more drought years with global warming. So that's sort of one observation um, that, that I would think people would, would, would worry about. Um, and you're, in, you're, you know, say what you're, whatever your comments are on that, but I'm also curious as to if you your number one choice of replacing the water capacity is expanding Calaveras. What lands or valleys or whatever would have to be flooded and given up from whatever use they're currently put to? I don't know what surrounds it, whether it's farmland or whether it's uh, just wild country or parks or whatever, but what, would, what lands would be sacrificed if you expand Calaveras Reservoir? Well, let me take your second question first and say, yeah, there, there are impacts from, from any, any reservoir, any dam, and, but the lands around Calaveras are, are, are nice. They're not Yosemite. Um, and to answer your other question, maybe we just need to do more than replacing the water. We need more water, more storage, and... Uh, Calaveras, actually, I, I would say is, is personally uh, the third choice from my perspective for some physical reasons I won't get into. We'd have to pump it up there, and, and it's expensive. Uh, groundwater, I think, is by far the best, and you could create a groundwater bank twice the size of Hetch Hetchy and improve water supply. Uh, and, Uh, the groundwater, the Bring groundwater. A Give a microphone. Um, the question was, where would the groundwater bank be? And the site is a place called Eastside Water District, which is just east of Turlock. They share the East uh, Turlock uh, Groundwater Sustainability Agency. Uh, there are farmers in Eastside that very much would like to recharge that groundwater, um, but there's. There's room there for probably probably twice the volume. There's some in the Turlock Irrigation District itself, um, but the western portion of Turlock doesn't really have a groundwater problem, doesn't really have space. Some in the east part of Turlock, and more so in, again, the east side water district. Kathy Trafton has a question. Vice Chairman Kathy Trafton. Yeah, so Spreck, thank you for coming today. There's so many interesting issues you're bringing up. One thing that interests me particularly is the reclamation efforts of having, um, you know, groundwater percolate back into the, into the ground. And I've seen some of those operations in farms um, in the Monterey Bay area where they're really trying to, you know, capture that water, the runoff. Um, I, I'm interested in terms of subsidence, subsidence, land subsidence, and how many of the aquifers have become so much smaller over the years and the ground compresses and so the aquifers are much smaller than they used to be. Um, is there, you know, so I mean, I wonder how that affects the efforts of reclaiming the, the rains that have fallen 
And is there any way to expand aquifers? I mean, there's a tremendous amount of land subsidence in the Central Valley, certainly in Mexico. You know, there are examples all over. So how does that play into it? Yeah, uh, land subsidence is a real problem. Uh, not so much where we want to recharge the groundwater. Uh, and there are certainly places in, 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 in uh, southwest Kern County where the state's biggest water banks are, where, where there hasn't really been subsidence. Uh, you folks may have heard about the Friant Kern Canal, which uh, we're spending several hundred million dollars to rebuild because literally the land underneath the canal subsided and the canal has been unusable and they've rebuilt it and again it's having the same sort of problems. But it's all geographically uh, different throughout California, depends a lot on the on, on, on how much water has been taken out, but more on, on, on the geology. And we don't have that problem in, uh, in Stanislaus County where Turlock, Modesto, and, and, and Eastside are, but it's a, it's a huge problem. Okay, so as a native San Franciscan, I'm thinking to myself, okay, what are the priorities that San Francisco has right now? What do we need to do? And I think to myself, where does this fit? So obviously we have an issue with housing uh, that is to say, there are people in the streets, and whether it's a housing issue or an institutional issue of some sort, it's an issue. So that's a priority. Uh, we've got um, the economic demise that's happening in San Francisco because homeless people are keeping tenants like Tiffany's from wanting to have a store in Union Square. So there are all these pretty big issues. What, what's your opinion about where this fits? Is this number 10? Is this number 25? Is this number 8? Where is it? Well, you know, you're talking about my day job. <laughs> and, and this is, I think, a visionary effort that uh, we should take on with, with all due speed, uh, as we should our other social ills and homelessness and, uh, in San Francisco and throughout California is, is a tragedy. And there are so many other issues that we do need to take on, but... Uh, I think we need to take them all on at once. Um, just a slight digression um, of, of the national scale. Uh, we need to put Congress back to work. Wherever you are politically, uh, right, left, center, you know, those folks are not doing their job. We need uh, legislation to handle so many tough issues immigration, health care, homelessness, military, climate, um, whatever, whatever, and you know, we're never gonna get perfect answers, but we need people to talk and we need people to work together and we need people to, to, to find solutions. And uh, you know, Martin Luther King said, the time is always right to do right. So you know, with respect to Hetch Hetchy, I think the time is to, to do that, and, uh, but not at the expense of, of anything else. Yes. Everett has a question. One quick last question. Sorry. Everett. Um, PG&E is no friend of this household. I live in a hundred. Keep the mic up close, Everett. I, I live in a hundred and forty-year-old Victorian. We put in. Wait, wait, Everett. Are you one hundred and forty or the house? The house. It takes a lot. <laughs> uh, ooh. But PG&E rate hikes have doubled at our home, and we're really, really careful um, about the heat. And um, but. PG&E is really, really uh, ripping apart the costs for most homeowners across the state, especially in the city, and yet they're the main source of power for us, and that comes from the Hetch Hetchy. What, what can we do to get that money profitable making company controlled and replace them with more, um, let's say, energy efficient ways to heat our homes? We kept the easy questions for the end, right? <laughs> oh, golly, you know, electricity has changed so much and gotten so much more expensive. And as far as I can tell, a big piece of the expense increases are the lawsuits from, from fires. And they tell me, and I'm, I don't claim to be the expert that but San Diego, San Diego Gas and Electric has done a better job of planning their transmission and having these big transmission lines not be in fire prone areas. It might be up here that in Northern California, you know, it's just as hot in the summer, 
but it's too wet in the winter. We have more vegetation. We've gone into various areas. It's a, it's a tough one. Uh, we need to hold pg es feet to the fire. Um, the, the solutions, I think, in some areas are to uh, bury or improve or better protect the transmission lines in other areas. You want to just have more locally sufficient systems and so forth. It's a, it's a, it's a, tough, it's a, it's a tough thing. So, Spreck Rosencrantz, Executive Director of Restore Hetch Hetchy, a longtime San Francisco family. Thanks for sitting for our questions and sharing your insights with the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thank you, buddy. Hey, Ron. Thank Thanks you. very much. And with that, we adjourn the luncheon. been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.